Hey, you. Does life ever give you headaches? I'm sure it does, but there are good headaches and bad headaches. I think chess gives you the best headache. So my goal today is to show you three incredible endgame puzzles or games played by grandmasters that will hopefully leave you with a good headache. That is the goal of today's video. So enough about headaches. The last puzzle is going to be by far my favorite. It is a game played by Dolmatov, who is Divoretsky's student. And I think he's slept on. I think not a lot of people know about him, but he's an absolute monster at the game. But we're going to start with puzzle number one, because that's how numbers work. So this position is white to move. Obviously, white is better because it's a good knight versus bad bishop. Why is it a bad bishop? Well, it's very, very restricted. You might be like, oh, this is not so hard. I'm just going to win a pawn, win the game. My king's in front of the pawn. But that only constitutes one of the two rules for winning king and pawn endgames. The second is opposition, which black has meaning you cannot infiltrate with your king, and whichever way you go, they're always going to sidestep, preventing you from infiltrating. And the second they push a pawn, this is just a draw. You stay in front of the pawn for as long as possible until you reach stalemate. Okay, so you might be like, okay, king f6. But the problem with this move is even, let's say, even like if you win the pawn, the bishop is free to roam. It will always be able to sacrifice itself for the pawn, and that will be a draw due to insufficient material. So that leaves us with king h6, the correct move. This prevents black's king from going to any of these squares, so the king has to go to h8. Now you go knight h4, not to win the pawn, to restrict the bishop from moving, because if the bishop gets free, it is a draw, but the bishop cannot get free because that is a mate. Black probably doesn't want that. So every time the king is on h8, you need to make sure you have eyes on g6 with the knight so that the bishop cannot move due to the ensuing mate. So king to g8, okay, we need to win, so we need to improve the knight. We don't need the knight to see g6 when the bishop cannot move. We need the knight to see g6 when the bishop can move. So king g8, essentially we're going to put black in Zook's one. Do we go knight f8 or knight f6? Knight f6 might look more natural, but then unfortunately you missed a golden opportunity to win because the bishop can move. You need your knight to see g6. Also, this creates a threat. So if bishop g8, knight g6 checkmate. If king g8, you win the game because you win the bishop. So that's the warm-up. That's puzzle number one. Now puzzle number two. So I forget which GM it was that said it, but he said treat knight and pawn endgames as you do king and pawn endgames because the similarities are apparent in the position. So why is white better here? Well, he has the space advantage uh, and his king is more up the board. It's more centralized. So if you go knight b8, there's really no threats, no routes for the knight. Knight b6 looks good. You might envision trying to get a knight to, for example, a2 to try to push the pawn. Uh, and then maybe a knight to d3 to try to push that pawn. But even if you get your knight to the perfect square, their knight is very easily able to guard all the pawns. So you have to think outside the box. Knight to f8. You're threatening to win this h7 pawn. So the king has to take the knight. But when the king takes the knight, it allows your king to infiltrate. And this knight is very awkward. So if it's awkwardly placed, it's as if it's not even there. Sometimes it's even worse. Sometimes it's detrimental to the position. If black wastes a move with king g8, you go up. So it's kind of the same thing as if the knight moves to c7 first. Don't take the f6 pawn because it's not a passer. So it's not a threat. Create your own pass pawn. Now when the knight moves, essentially you're going to win all the pawns. Create some queens. Win the game. So knight to f8, king takes king e6. Black came up with the clever knight g7. There's many ways to win, but simplify the position. Test your calculation. Try to go as far as possible and calculate the line. If this is winning, it makes sense to snap the knight off. And it is winning. Let's talk about why it's winning. Where do you put the king? King to e7, opposition, boxing out the enemy king. And then also you promote at the same time, but you promote first, which means you have a free move and you can use that free move to go to F8 and give a check. Now it's going to be the same method, regardless of where the king goes. Do not take this pawn because check my apologies for the arrow. I cut off the board that gave me a headache, but it happens. Now I'm at least going to check and make sure I didn't cut off the board. I'm making sure that that board is not cut off. So we give a check. Now, wherever the king moves, you take the pawn with check. And I like how white chose to win this game. He's just like, I'm going to go king f7. King's the best piece in the end game. You don't have a check. I mean, you do, but then you have no more checks. In black, black resigned in this position. 
because the last check he has is a losing one because you just promote the pawn. And there was a mate threat, so he resigned. Fair statement. All right, the best one. Dolmatov pulled a win out of thin air in this position. You might be thinking, hey, a bishop and a knight are better than a rook. Chess is so position specific. In this position, he masterfully won the game. You might be thinking rook to d8. Oh, I want to go here and win the a pawn. I want to get to the second rank. But there's no barrier for entry, right? Because they can easily stop the two files. I think the next logic... Oh, and you don't want to take because then, I mean, white will be winning. The second he gets his bishop to c4 and clamps down, the longer the game goes on, the more the bishop and the knight coordinate and overpower the rook. So you might be like, oh, rook to h8. Okay, the knight moves. You take the pawn because you don't want him to take the pawn. You take another pawn. And you might think, hey, this is winning. But it's actually losing. Rook to h5, king to f4. These pawns do nothing. The bishop will come to c4. The knight will improve itself. Win pawn by pawn. Win the game. So the move is c4. So if we get b takes c4, you can play it in a slow manner or you can play it in a speedy manner and try to just promote like this. They sack the bishop. It looks a little scary, but their pawns are not well coordinated and their king is too far. Rook to a4, you're going to pick up a pawn. So pawn c4, bishop takes, we get. The point is rook c8, and essentially, even though it's a semi-open file, it's really an open file because if white, for example, wastes a move, this sacrifice does indeed exist, and you're just going to make a queen and win the game. So the bishop has to move. It chooses to move to d3, the best square. And now you might be thinking, hey, don't I just take, pin the bishop and win a pawn? Well, you do win a pawn, but you don't win the game. Basically, white's king is in the box, and the pieces are very coordinated against this b-file push of the pawn. So that doesn't win. Did not mean to go back that far. So you should go a3. What does this move do? Well, your pawn is one closer to promoting. It's two away. And you isolate the base of their pawn chain on a2, where you want to infiltrate the second rank. We get knight to f4 trying to bring his pieces into the game. Logical. This ties the knight down to the bishop. We get king to e3 and rook takes b3. Okay, does it lose a rook? No, because there's only one more light square, so they can't stop you from promoting. So we get king e3, rook takes b3. We get knight to e2. And in this position, rook to b2 trying to grab this pawn. White went bishop to c4 defending the pawn. Don't take that. And okay, b3 just wins the game. Bishop takes, rook takes. The same sacrifice ensues, and you make a queen. This was, this is up there with my favorite puzzle. So I don't like these generic puzzles. I didn't think these were generic. Let me know. Did you guys get a good headache? I hope so. So as always, thank you guys for watching. As always, have a great day. As always, three times now.